Welcome to today's American Security Project webinar. This is an on-the-record conversation that will be available for attribution. A recording of this conversation will be posted on our website. All audience members will be muted during the discussion, but please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions to the panelists. With that, Jessica, over to you. Thank you everyone for joining us today for our webinar focused on celebrating 30 years of the National Guard Bureau State Partnership Program. Today we have with us our honored guest, Colonel Scott Humphrey, Chief of the International Affairs Division at the National Guard Bureau. Colonel, welcome. Thank you for being with us today. Well, thank you, Jessica. Really appreciate the opportunity. Great. Um, we've got about 45 minutes here, so I'm going to take the first probably about a half hour to, to ask some questions of you just about the program and, and why we're here and what we're celebrating. Uh, and then I'll weave in questions from the Q&A uh, as they come up. So uh, let's start at the beginning. This year, uh, the National Guard Bureau is celebrating 30 years of the state partnership program. What can you tell us about how it's evolved, why it was incepted in the first place, and, and where we are today? Well, at 30 years ago, 1993 was the near the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And as the Soviet satellite states um, were looking for, you know, to find their direction, as it were, uh, we saw opportunities uh, with those Soviet satellite states and the Yugoslav territories that, uh, that there was a need for some, some connection, some trust, um, some leadership uh, from a U.S. perspective. And it was determined that the National Guard with the longevity of people who would work in an area for, for decades rather than a what we call a, um, a change of station cycle of maybe two or three years. Uh, if you're gonna be in the same area for decades, you could connect with a country and, uh, and provide some longevity to your relationship. And that's probably, if I was to tie a word together, SPP equals relationship. And so for the last 30 years now, uh, we've been building on those relationships and we are now at a point where we are celebrating our 30th year and our 100th country in the program. That's fantastic. Congratulations to everyone who's, who is now or has ever been involved in the state partnership program. I was first exposed to the state partnership program uh, several years ago when I was working in Kosovo uh, as the Iowa National Guard was there. And you have also have experience sort of on the ground with the Washington National Guard. And when we previously talked, you highlighted some, just, just a short anecdotal story about that relationship and how it was cultivated into special uh, with a certain Malaysian officer. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and tell the audience about that? Oh, absolutely. This is, uh, this is a real uh, one that pulls on the heartstrings. So uh, right around Thanksgiving time two years ago, uh, Colonel Hassan, who was a part of the Malaysian delegation in the United States for a, a set of talks called Airman to Airman Talks, uh, we were at dinner. And it would, we'd only been on the ground, for, they'd only been there for a short time and we had just gotten our drinks and he fell back in his chair and suffered a major, a major medical event, um, which led to his, his untimely demise. And so as we watched all the regular active duty folks begin to leave the country and to go back to their places, the guardsmen, we were left on the ground to work that trust issue um, for Colonel Hassan and his family. We were able to very quickly get a emergency visa for his, fam for his wife. We were able to get her an escort, fly her into the country. We got behind the rope. Um, there at Customs and Border and brought her to his bedside. And even during COVID, this was right at the, you know, the top end of all the things going on in COVID, we were able to get her bedside with her husband before she ultimately had to make the decision to, uh, to pull the plug and, uh, and let him expire. Um, but because of the Muslim faith, um, we had to very quickly move because uh, she said, hey, I, I, can't, I can't take him home. He needs to be buried quickly. And so we were able to find a Muslim cemetery in the local area. We were able to arrange for a um, for a full military honors funeral because that was one of the things is hey he served honorably, you know for at that point nearly 30 years of his life in the military, and so she wanted something that represented um, his service and his dedication. Fortunately for us, the Malaysian flag, very similar to the U.S. flag, folds the same way, so we were able to very quickly adjust and adapt our our uh, our ceremony to where we're able to combine it with a, a Muslim ceremony. And the washing of the body, the moving of his of his body up to the graveside, mm -hmm. along with the 21 gun salute, with the folding of the flag, the presentation of the flag from Malaysia, as well as the shell casings. I mean, it just we were able to bring together all of the things that a partner would do, where we not we don't necessarily think that a, another partner would do anything like that. 
but uh, because we did, um, it was just an amazing, amazing opportunity. And lastly, just through coordination between, you know, when you have language barriers, when you have other cultural barriers, we were able to intervene on behalf of the Malaysian government who wanted to pay the hospital bill. And we negotiated the bill from over three quarters of a million dollars down to $252,000 wow. uh, just by working with the, uh, with the hospital and saying, listen, you, if anybody's worked insurance, you know that um, next thing you're gonna get is a, hey, this pill was $200. And we said, listen, they can never be bothered again. They're gonna write a check. Can you please allow this to be the end? And, and it was just an amazing outpouring of support, both from the hospital community, the guard, and the Malaysian community with over 200 people attending during COVID outside with masks on watching this event go down. So it was a great uh, cooperation between Washington State and the nation of Malaysia. That's a true testament, an unfortunate one, but a true testament sure. to the trust that is being built throughout these programs. So on the flip side of that, sort of more on a positive note, um, this is also a, an incredible opportunity for U.S. servicemen and women uh, to travel abroad, to, to experience sort of different cultures, different environments, different operating theaters, different operational constraints. Um, what can you tell us about the kinds of activities that fall under the SPP umbrella? So, so most of the SPP events, especially in the past, have all been based on more of the soft skills. So those aren't necessarily where we're going to practice our combat training. These are for how do we hold, you know, a, a medical subject matter expert exchange to exchange best practices for battlefield care. You know, how are we going to conduct surgeries out in the field? How are we going to, you know, prepare people for a, a chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear event that might happen in their port or in their country? How do we take the things that we've learned through the things that we've dealt with in the United States, and then we export that uh, with our partner, and we learn from them as well because we have people who have who have been working these issues for decades in their country just because of where they live. So, uh, what do they say? Um, where you sit or where you stand depends on where you sit in the world. And so, as you look at the world map behind you, everybody has a unique story to bring. And so, those are truly exchanges. And again, of soft skills, we look at rule of law. You know, we have the lawyers get together and discuss, you know, how do we make sure that that um, that folks are, you know, um, doing things in an appropriate manner? Are they looking at resilience? You know, it's uh, it's very, you know, a lot of countries don't necessarily prepare their folks for retirement in the same way that we do. How do we make sure that after they've been in combat, they have the mental health um, services that they need within their own country? So these are examples of the softer skills to where, again, we're building relationships and trust. Uh, along with what we do. Very interesting. And, and I, as a climate security person, I'm very interested in how how these trainings and activities are being expedited or maybe focusing more on natural disaster response or some of these response activities. But but I want to I want to dive in on something that you said right there about the about the every state has at least one partner. Some states have more. So can you tell us how a partner nation becomes an SPP partner? and what it looks like when a state has more than one. Absolutely, so, so it starts off as a, it's a whole of government exercise. So starting at the embassy in the foreign land, that foreign government will present a letter to the ambassador saying, we want to be part of the SPP program. That letter is then brought into the combatant commander, such as the commander of the Indo-Pacific or the commander of Central Command or, or European Command. Those commanders will then rack and stack and make a list of areas where they think they need to do the most work. Um, if that country is selected on the short list, it then makes it to the office of the Secretary of Defense. And inside there, they'll decide which two or three countries on average will get picked up. For this year alone, we had five. So wow. this, was, uh, this was kind of a banner year for us. I don't think it was necessarily to get us to 100 at 30, but it worked. Uh, so <laughs> but, uh, but we will usually pick two or three. And then those countries are, um, are, are awarded a, a partnership and then it becomes the, another whole of government event to determine what things that partnership needs. Maybe they have more of a maritime presence. And so we need maybe a coastal state that has an army or an air national guard that has coastal equities. Maybe it's a uh, mountain terrain that has uh, lots of snow. Maybe it's a Nordic nation. So you wanna try to match up the needs of that particular country with a state that maybe has a diaspora of people, you know, you're uh, from Poland and Illinois. And so you have those relationships 
um, that are a very natural fit, Georgia and Georgia, who would know, who would figure that out, right? <laughs> so um, so those are, whether it's just anecdotal or where it's a, whether it's to the diaspora or something like that, we'll end up with situations where um, we will then allow people to apply for that partnership, given those criteria. And then usually within about a, a five to six month window from the time they were awarded until the time we are picked a state, they'll have what's called a signing ceremony where they'll get together. And most recently, the coolest one I was at was with Norway and with, and uh, Minnesota. They have a 50 year relationship in other things that they've now ported over into an SPP relationship. And they actually had the agreement tattooed on the back of a, a reindeer skin. And so each side signed the reindeer wow. skin and now that's hanging in their headquarters buildings in each of their, you know, each state or country in order to to say, hey, we've agreed to enter into a relationship for the SPP for the long term. Oh boy, we're gonna get lots of hate mail from PETA, PETA I guess. I know, um, I know. We didn't have anything to do with it though, <laughs> so we've got plausible deniability here. Um, okay, so so you have these partner nations, you have these activities, but there are also sort of multi-dimensional communication mechanisms. And Vermont was mentioned uh, in a previous conversation. Can you talk about Vermont and its partnerships and how it's able to facilitate sort of non-traditional international diplomacy? You bet. So before I even go down that road, the idea would be how do we export peace and how do we create a partnership or partnerships plural that helps to export that peace and or um, a, a way of doing business that uh, that meets with international norms, let's say. So uh, the country of Senegal is partnered with Vermont. Vermont is, also, Vermont is also partnered with Austria. So now Austria will do trilateral events in Senegal with Vermont in order to bring the things that they do within, um, within Austria down to Senegal. So it's, uh, I think that's the, that's the cool part about having multiple partnerships. Um, on average, it's, it's a couple. Um, everybody has at least one. Um, but uh, the, I think right now the best is, or the, the, the most, I wouldn't say the best, but the most is Montana who has four partnerships. So uh, some have really gotten out there and, and have, have completely uh, bought in. And, uh, and others are pacing themselves. But we do believe there's some capacity in the guard to continue building those branches and sequels and those connections. Because uh, uh, we, we, and we think that number probably is somewhere from 100 to maybe 130, but probably not 200 by 60 years. <laughs> we're probably gonna, we'll probably call it quits at about that 130 mark. So, but we still have a little bit of work to do, but uh, we're slowly gonna build towards that and, uh, and try to get our, our budgets to align with that as well. Sure. So, so did COVID change any of your activities at all? Did it, did it change well, the nature of how and how, how frequently you engage? So we, we tried as best we could to transition some of our talks to online engagements. Um, you know, like this Zoom meeting where we can have a big impact, um, it's very hard to exchange best practices and, and tactics, techniques, and procedures and really do something that's very tactical and hands-on in an online environment. For a talk like this, it's, it works great because I can have a wide audience. But uh, when it came to those engagements, I think we did struggle. And um, and now that people are back and all of our engagements are turned back on essentially worldwide, um, the impact is being felt. And right now, I might you know it's it the, the chief of the National Guard Bureau will tell you very quickly that this absolutely is one of his his number one priority when it comes to the partnership side of the things because it does create um, it's it's a retention tool. So if I can get somebody off of Zoom on a plane, fly to a foreign land and do some amazing things where, with something that they're comfortable in. And now they practice deploying, they practice their skills that they do in their federal job. And they learned about a new culture and got to break bread with their brothers and sisters that are also in the military. All of those things combine to help me keep people in the service. And that's all very important um, for the longevity. Interesting. So. So I'm gonna pivot a little bit um, and ask a little bit about measures of effectiveness or measures of success for the program. Sure. Is, is it just about maintaining the relationship and making sure that things happen on sort of an annual basis? Uh, I believe the, the goal is maintaining security relationships between the United States and a partner nation in the, in the long-term view of common interests. How do you figure out if a program is successful or if, if a country is going to graduate or, or if you're really uh, making an impact? So the interesting part there is I would personally say, this is Scott speaking, I would personally say that relationship sometimes might be enough. 
But unfortunately, the US government doesn't think so. They want, they want something tangible that they can use to say, hey, we're effective in this area because fill in the blank. So we've actually are, have a fairly nascent program of uh, how we're looking at assessing and measuring the effectiveness of our program. And so we're still trying to work on what those metrics look like. And again, I think it starts with relationship, but then how do you progress with a country who, as you said, graduates to the next level? How do we get to a point where now if that country can export peace, is that sufficient to say that they've arrived? Um, you know, and Austria already has a, has a pretty robust military, but Senegal, maybe not so much. So when Senegal can now export that into Somalia or pick a country around the world, right? How does that then let us evaluate whether or not our interactions have been effective with them? So we're getting there, but it is definitely something that's uh, fairly new to our program because for the longest time, uh, relationship access um, to an area has been really our, uh, our hallmark. And I think California, right, and their relationship with Ukraine has really shown that. No, no question. Uh, an example would be when the when the bombs started going off from Russia into Ukraine, the first call wasn't to the big, you know, the Pentagon. The first calls were to the adjutant general in the state of California who had relationship with their commanding generals saying, hey, we're being bombed, help. Well, that was then the job of California to slowly transition that relationship through the trust that was developed with California over to the larger military that had zero relationship specifically with Ukraine. And as they built that out, then we end up in a, in a good spot to where now most of the relationship is transitioned over to what's going on with the bigger military and less of it's with California, but California can now begin going back to some of their, their, their basics, which is how do we help people handle the resilience aspects and, and do mental health engagements so that we're helping all of those soldiers that are dealing with all of this in Ukraine manage as they come out of combat and as the country goes back into you know, the status quo. And that relationship, I believe, as you said, has been built over the past 30 years. And one, one of my favorite sayings that I've heard you and several others say is that you can't surge trust. Amen. And I think I think that's one of the things that SVP is particularly adept at pursuing that that strategy uh, throughout the program. So so you've been involved in this in a variety of capacities, both in Washington State and Washington, D.C. Uh, what do you think are the biggest challenges and opportunities for the state partnership program? Oh, sure. Um, so what's interesting is the security cooperation budget nationwide is about six billion dollars a year. And of that the SPP program does about 20 to 30% of all engagements for security cooperation worldwide, and almost 50% if you're looking at uh, Southern Command or in Africa, Africa Command, when you look at those areas, we're doing almost 50% of the engagements, and we're doing that on 1% of that $6 billion budget. So the, the, the ability for the guard to multiply, um, you know, the, the, what do they say, the loaves and the fishes <laughs> from, from very small amounts, we're able to really um, make a lot happen. And that's because the people that are doing the work love what they do. They're bringing in their civilian skills. If you think about it, when, uh, when I've got someone that works at the Microsofts or Googles or the Amazons and the web services side, and they go and do a cyber exchange with another country, when that country is finding themselves regularly under attack from another country, we now have people that work in industry and they're in the guard that are able to assist with some uh, pretty big problems that I don't think uh, the active duty can appreciate the, the level of competence that the guard can bring. That's very interesting. Uh, I'm gonna weave in a, a question now from the chat. How have you made trust successfully compete against the mega projects that the Chinese are building in the countries our SPP are operating in? So, so I think there's been a period of time where um, we may not have been competing or out competing in those situations. But I think, uh, I think writ large, the, uh, the governments are beginning to see that uh, the Chinese have a pretty predictable or those larger countries have a pretty predictable pattern that they basically they don't care about what's going on in the human rights world. They just care about the finance side. And as long as you can pay the bills, you can continue to use the things that they're building for you with these mega projects. But with all the strings attached, and you look at like a Sri Lanka and the fact that they have or may lose their port 
um, because they can't pay the bills on that because they got in over their head. Um, I think these countries and the word is getting out that, hey, this SPP thing and the relationships we have with genuine people that are pretty transparent um, are, are a better way to go. It's, a, it's, it's uh, not just a way, but it's also a better way. Hmm. Very interesting. So um, SPP is obviously doing mill to mill activities and there is a whole of government approach. So you, so you engage in activities both with militaries and, and with other entities in partner nations. Have there been any instances where SPP has reevaluated their relationship or, or decided that it's not fruitful anymore or needed to pivot from engaging? So kind of, but not really, because once you're wed to a state, we want to keep you wed forever. Um, we, we, we can allow for a legal separation, but it doesn't, it's not, it's not uh, full divorce. And the reason why is because governments change, people change, hearts and minds change. And when those changes happen, you want to be able to leverage the things that were, that were done in the past. Hey, here's some pictures of a happier time when, uh, when we were engaging and working together. So um, an example would be Idaho and Cambodia. There's, there isn't a lot of room for maneuver in Cambodia, but Idaho is still with that country and in belief that at some point we'll be able to start um, making differences again. When you look at Oregon and Vietnam, for example, the work that, that Oregon has done with Vietnam has been phenomenal and it, it didn't happen easily and it didn't happen overnight because for the longest time they, they weren't um, in great relationship, but nowadays uh, they've really come a long way to include even in, you know, an aircraft carrier being to go into their waters to, to do port calls just because relationships change and people change over time. So, so you brought up Vietnam. So I, I'm going to pose a question about sort of any sort of South China Sea scenario. How do you see the SPP leveraging those relationships in any sort of South China Sea issue? Well, again, opinion only. Um, this is where we get back to the idea that if there's a trust that's built person to person, breaking bread in relationship with uh, like a country like Malaysia, where I spent almost 190 days out of three and a half years in Malaysia, building relationships wow. and working with them. And so if, if, and now we have a full-time person that actually is able to live there, which we, as we do in almost all of our 100 countries, we have one guardsman that actually gets to live and work out of the embassy called a bilateral affairs officer. And they're, they're completely embedded in that security cooperation relationship. And they are responsible for the comings and goings of those guardsmen in and out of that country. So as that happens, my hope, my belief, even though a course of action, hope is not necessarily a, a good course of a action. Strategy. It is, it is one that exists. And my hope is that when the day, the tough day comes and a, and an advers and a partner has to decide between an adversary or the U S that they'll lean toward the way that we do business rather than that adversary, because of that trust that's been built over years and decades. Fair enough. Um, so you mentioned that there are five, five countries this year. What are the five countries? Oh, now you're going to test me, I see. Okay. So no, it's, it's uh, Norway. Norway was the first one. We, we actually included Samoa with Fiji and Tonga. So we added Samoa um, for the Nevada relationship, uh, Minnesota with the Norway. We had uh, Gabon is, uh, is one that's still right now. We've got all the applications in. So we'll have a, a name for Gabon here shortly. And then also Zambia and Malawi were two countries that are going to come under one umbrella. So they're, they're of a size that we're going to put one state with uh, with those two countries together. So those are the five that we ended up with this year. So how do you decide, there are a couple of instances and, and our one of my colleagues was asking about this. You have 100 country, countries, but 88 partnerships. And the math works out that you do group some of the countries together with one, one US state. How does that work and how was that decision made? Well, well, an example, let me, let me go to my map here real quick. I wanna make sure I got the words Sure, right. sure. So when, uh, when I look at um, when I look at uh, Senegal and um, and I'm not, of course I, it's not on the map because it's it's not there yet, but uh, Senegal surrounds a country that uh, that would love to have a partnership, and so we're likely going to go ahead and, and merge if we if we are, they do get selected, we're likely going to merge them into something that makes sense because that Senegal's got a, a good track record of improving over time and we would bring them in to, to help with that country. And you're probably looking at your map going, all right, what is that country? I know it's right there. And it's, it's on the tip of my tongue, but I apologize. Um, same thing within the, you know, when you're looking at, um, you know, Fiji, Tonga and Samoa, all those countries 
very small island countries, small militaries. In some cases, they only have a professional police force, not a military. So those engagements are, are really important and they, they need to rely on each other as, as island nations in order for their survival as well. Because there's a lot of trade and a lot of sharing of resources that go on between those. So having Nevada in that corner of the world works out well. Um, all the RSS countries, the Bahamas and so on, having seven nations all close together working with Florida, that's all, that's all goodness. Are there any countries, is it, is it the Gambia? The Gambia, yes. The Gambia, thank okay. Thank um, yeah, sure, no problem. Um, so it, are there any countries that are on like, I, I don't know if you can answer this, on a wish list? Like, are there any strategic countries that we're thinking, hey, we would really like to partner with them because we'd really like to cultivate this relationship? Yeah, Narnia, Neverland. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. mean, yes. So no, we, we do. Um, and so that, that list, we have a, we have like our next 30 list that okay. we keep, but then each of the combatant commanders have their own list where they don't share with us what their ranking is. Who's number one, who's number 10, because we, we would prefer that, that that be a closed conversation. So, so that the, uh, the, the whole of government can actually look at what's in the best interest of the entire United States. And uh, so we keep the rank order to ourselves, but there, but there are absolutely countries that are uh, that are in the running and have great interest in joining the program. And some of them have had their interest letters in for five or six years, and other ones uh, just put them in the last two or three months. So there's always a you know people showing interest in uh, getting becoming a part of the program. Is that um, the OSD adjudication of of those who who are applying? When does that occur? Does that occur? Like once in the a year. Fall? Uh, yeah, once it's a year? usually 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 each uh, over the winter time is when that will that adjudication will occur. So we'll we'll know typically by October November um, is the time when we'll know when uh, a, a name is coming up on the list. We will then create the criteria of who could apply to and match with the needs of that nation, and then uh, we put it out for bid. And that's what's out right now for uh, Zambia, Malawi, uh, the Gambia, or excuse me, Gabon. Um, and then Samoa and, and Norway are already paired up. Interesting. Okay. Um, is, uh, is Pakistan in the program? We've got a question from the audience. Uh, they are not. They are not. Okay. Um, who do you coordinate with that determines the lines of effort that you will focus on in a particular country? So, right. So typically that starts at the embassy level. So we have the Office of Defense Cooperation, the ODC, and they are looking for you know, how do we how do we leverage and manage all of the things that need to happen within this country and where can the SPP best fit? And our bilateral affairs officer works in the embassy as kind of a deputy to that chief of the of the offices of defense cooperation. And so as that deputy, they're looking at, hey, the guard could do this. Hey, shouldn't we do that? And we'll add in um, and look at like a five year plan of, hey, these are all the things we want to do to help move the ball down the field during the course of the next five years. And that's a rolling five years. And that's where the, that's where the guard will then be involved at the combatant commander level. So then you've got your, you know, your four-star general in each of those commands who says, yes, I agree that those things should be done within this country and we'll let, we want the guard to do that. And so we're in very close cooperation, um, especially in probably the last 10 years um, where we've done a better job of syncing what we do with the rest of the whole of government approach. And it's no longer just the guard building relationship, but it's also the guard in support of the objectives of the uh, combatant commander. Would you say, and this is gonna be a complete guess, um, but would you say that your activities are mostly tactical in nature or does it just depend greatly on, on where a partner is in the process? It, it can be a little bit of both. So an example will be, there will be some squad training for a, at, at the level of Seaburn, maybe civil engineering, working on roads and runway repair or medical or natural disaster, very tactical things will happen. Usually with five to 10 people coming from that state, going and working with anywhere from five to 20 from that nation and in order to practice a particular tactical skill. And then at the operational level, I've been involved in an exercise called Bersama Warrior in Malaysia a few times now. And that's at the operational level of war of how do you plan and manage the forces that need to be employed with some sort of an incursion should something happen. So this is the planning phases. And then at the strategic level, we have key leader engagements where our adjutant general for the state 
will meet with the chief of defense or the chief of a particular service and have discussions about how do we want the forces to move forward in that five-year plan. So we will work completely at the tactical, operational, and the strategic level um, throughout an entire year with uh, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of between eight and 10 engagements happening in a country in a particular year. Some, wow. some are even more than that, but I, I would say it averages eight to 10. Um, I've known countries and states that have had as many as 30 in a year. Wow, that's a lot. Um, um, on very little budget. <laughs> well, I'm glad you brought up the budget uh, again, because we've got another request from an audience member to talk a little bit more about the, the significant, and this is significant, return on investment, uh, yes. given the cost of, of the program. Can you talk a little bit more about that? It comes from the NDAA and your, your budget. Um, what does that look like? Are, are we hoping for yeah. an increase in the budget, of course? Well, here's <laughs> another hope, Koa, right? We hope we <laughs> yeah. get more budget. Um, so it, we're right now running around the $40 million a year mark. So $40 million a year for 100 partnerships, plus the overhead of keeping the lights on for our program. Um, it really limits you know, how much you have for a particular country. So you're in the $400,000 a year per partnership range, maybe a little bit less. So when you're talking about anywhere from eight to uh, 30 engagements in a particular year, that doesn't go a long way. So you have to be very judicious in how you do that. One of the ways we'll make our money last longer is if a particular unit has their federal training and they need to do that federal training for their two weeks a year. You've heard of the National Guard, you know, one weekend a month and two weeks a year. If during that two weeks a year, we can take them and allow them to do their federal mission overseas with their partner, practicing not only doing the skills, but teaching them and or exchanging and sharing best practices. Now I've killed several birds with one stone. I've been able to deploy the member. I've been able to get them ready to go overseas and make sure all their shots and medical and dental and everything are up to date. I then got them working with a partner in a foreign land. They've set up their tents. They've done all the things that they would need to do to engage. And it, so it makes for a happy accident that they're using their two weeks to accomplish multiple missions. That saves us a little Try bit on the pay and allowances side, but then they, uh, then they end up uh, traveling um, on the money that's there from the budget. It's a strategy, not an accident. Um, <laughs> um, another question uh, from the audience. What change have you seen in the kinds of training and exchanges that SPP countries are seeking from the U.S. since Russia attacked Ukraine? You bet. I think, I think there's a lot more uh, need for logistic support. You think of all of the, the weapons and the armaments that are coming from all over the EU and all over NATO, um, and those, those weapons are pouring in. And the logistics side of how do you track those? How do you inventory? How do you train on those? Um, so we're, there's, a, there's a huge need uh, for that. I mean, even I was just, a, I was fortunate enough to go to Brussels and meet with the EU recently. And during that event, they talked about how the way the laws and the rules are written, it could take sometimes a month or more for a single tank on the bed of a truck to cross one border, let alone the six or seven borders it needs in order to get toward Ukraine for it to be donated. And so that's where I think uh, one of the biggest skills that we're able to help with is that logistics. Humanitarian assistance is a, is a huge, huge thing, given the uh, just the uh, um, just the uh, oh my goodness, uh, <laughs> trying to think of the word that goes with that. But uh, but given the uh, the folks that are just needing a huge amount of humanitarian assistance um, as refugees fleeing their own land trying to find ways to house, employ, and put those people to, to meaningful work so that they aren't just home or their new home in a tent, uh, trying to figure out uh, and pay attention to what's going on in their own country. Yeah, um, and this, this I'm gonna pivot a little bit to a, a shout out here that we have uh, in the Q&A from uh, Mark Kustra. Uh, Mark would like to give a shout out to the excellent work that the Washington National Guard did and continues to do in Thailand via SPP. There was a strong interest with the Thai government to be trained in a non-traditional military skill set, such as emergency response and law enforcement, enforcement. Do you think that the state partnership program participants have the right authorities funding and relationships within their state governments and or the federal interagency to leverage that expertise? I, I say yes, because I'm familiar with our Thailand relationship, which is now I think 19 years old, maybe 20 at this point. And so because of that relationship, we've been able to leverage people from the Port Authority 
um, working in the ports of Lam Shabam in Thailand. We're working with uh, firefighters. We're working with police officers who not only are police officers in their regular life, but they're also then um, guardsmen. And so we're able to bring in, um, you know, escalation of the use of force. We're able to work in how do we help them with better governance, um, given the fact that both civilian and guardsmen can go there and, and help in those specific situations. Um, but you also have to be careful, given, given the things that have occurred in Thailand, it's a, it's a real tough situation. It's a fine line to walk, but that's where you use the rule of law, escalation of the use of force. The, some of the softer skills, um, we're not teaching you how to um, necessarily manage riot control, but how to, how to manage riots better. Um, if, I've, if I've answered kind of the, the intent of the question a little better there. I think so. Um, can you speak, this is another question from the audience, can you speak about any examples of SPP that have resulted in broader whole of society relationships, whether are commercial ties or university relationships with a given country? The answer is yes. And I, I probably should have done a little bit of pre better preparation, but I'm aware <laughs> that there are multiple universities that have an exchange program to where we have people from that state will move to the country and vice versa. And they will, they will bed down different technologies and different assistance programs. For example, there was a country that was having difficulties with the, the right kinds of water filtration for their entire country on a large scale. And so using the university exchanges, the technology was built within the university for that country then to learn about it with their students who were in the school. And they were then able to export that education back to their home country, along with the state helping bed down that technology there in the in their country as well so there, I, i'm very aware that there's been some real wins there i just apologize i don't remember the uh the state or the university that's okay uh we can always get it on the flip side when we there do the go. event recap so uh, we'll add it in there um we've got about six minutes left i want to give you the opportunity to uh to tell us some anecdotal stories about your experience on the ground with svp do you have any fun stories of cultural mishaps or or chaos abounding on, on the ground well i will uh, i'll have to to air my dirty laundry here so i was at an <laughs> event it was a humanitarian assistance disaster response response event called thai mall which is the thailand malaysia um exercise a, a joint and combined exercise and we were way up on the northern border of malaysia right next to thailand and so that is one of the areas where two countries who fought quite the the communist insurgency on the on the border there in the in the late 70s early 80s um, there's not a lot of areas where they agree but they do agree that the place floods and that they need emergency management and they need to work together to manage those floods because that is border agnostic and so as part of this event um, they had built these amazing rope bridges um, in order to help evacuate people and i don't think they'd quite finished tightening it yet but uh with the group of of, of people who were observing um, we had we had Vietnam, Myanmar, we had Brunei, um, had Cambodia. I had a whole list of countries that were there. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to let these guys, you know, they all need to go with me across this bridge. Let's go. So it's probably close to 100 yards of tight stretched rope with little handholds going across. And I got about to the halfway point. No one else joined me, by the way. <laughs> and I ended up flipping upside down, but I didn't let go. I held on, I was able to climb back up onto the rope and finish. And the video pans over to all of the people that are doing the exercise, running with life vests to come save me, <laughs> even though I'm a good swimmer. <laughs> but just being willing to you know, engage and enjoy and be happy with what you're doing, it, it pays huge dividends uh, when you're willing to show that friendship and that relationship is truly that, it's a relationship. That's fantastic. And, and again, you know, we're celebrating 30, we, um, uh, collective we, right? right. Um, celebrating 30 years of this. And, and this is really impactful, I would imagine, for U.S. soldiers as well, to get to experience the sights and the smells and the challenges of being places that they may never have gotten a chance to go otherwise. So, so as we pivot toward the future, what would you like to see SPP do? How would you like to see SPP evolve other than so additional funding? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. But additional funding leads to other things. Um, we, I like, I like to allude to something that we are in, internally calling SBP 2.0. It's a graduate level program where we're not necessarily taking countries that are really struggling for in the basics, but we're trying to get them to again to export that piece 
become a, a, a trusted partner in being able to assist with our efforts. And we're now doing it together and they're doing it without us. So Morocco, for example, does a phenomenal job of going out around the world by themselves. And, and like where Austria and Vermont get together, um, Morocco is now doing that on their own. So, so we've, I think, made an impact. And I, I want to see that impact continue to grow. And then also look at how can we maybe with some of our larger nations, like, uh, like with the Norway, even though Minnesota's with them, because they're so large and so capable, how do we bring in individual niche um, uh, capabilities from different states? So how could something that's in Hawaii besides the, the sandy beaches be used in Norway to help them do better at something? And so, uh, so being able to expand it in a way where more states than one, because once you've wed to a state, you're also uh, cousins, they're, the other cousins are, uh, are part of the family as well. So we try to, we're trying to incorporate more of that as we move forward and as we mature out this program. That's fantastic. Well, we've got a few minutes left. Is there anything else that you would like to add um, I, I feel like this has been a great conversation and, and not enough Americans, I think, really understand the, the National Guard uh, and, and all of the myriad things and activities that you're doing globally. Um, have you seen an uptick in, in recent years post-COVID in activities? In, in act, yeah, so, so I think, I don't even necessarily want to go, there's plenty of activities going on to where there's never, there's, and again, everybody comes back to, there's just not enough money for all the capacity that we have yeah, in the in the guard, but this is really truly as close to your hometown as this gets. Guardsmen live and work in the hometown that they're from. They typically serve because they want to, not because they have to, and they'll do it for decades on end. Sometimes in the same position, they'll just continue to grow in rank, but they'll still work in the same organization for their entire career. So having people who love their country, who are who learn a skill that they're able to export. Um, to the, not only the world, but also then to their community, I think is the, the best part about the Guard is because it keeps everything tied back to their family um, right in their community. So that's good, whether it be firefighting, whether it be floods, whether it be other natural disasters, whether it be uh, you know Seattle being taken over by riots where the local guardsmen can go and help those police officers manage those situations. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's a very cool thing. And, uh, and we like to then export that to those other countries and and again, through relationship and through trust, um, help put the U.S. in a better footing around the world. Well, thank you so much for that. And in, on behalf of everybody watching, either now or later, uh, and on behalf of the American Security Project, thank you for your service. Congratulations on 30 years of the State Partnership Program, and we look forward to 30 more. Very good. Thank you.